I want to especially say thank you to everyone for joining. My name is Uluashe Yadeladju, and I'm the head of growth at Gradely.ng. Um, today is not the day to talk about Gradely or talk about um, me. Today is the real time to talk about um, what is concerning um, all of us here as education stakeholders. For me, I've been trying to create tech solutions for schools and one of the things we've learned is that you cannot really do anything um, outside the school itself. Upon interactions with schools, we see the main, um, the main crux of conversation today is that governments, um, whilst private schools are, are, are ready to reopen, and we have a lot of conversations around um, readiness for reopening and all, governments in Nigeria has released um, the guideline for school reopening. When we saw this guideline, it was clear that education will never be the same and schooling will never be the same. And that was, there is a strong need to have a conversation on what this really means for us as stakeholders and what, what how visible is this, what do we need to um, implement this? More importantly, what are the key learnings from this? Um, I'll give a summary of what is in the guideline for school reopening. In the end, um, Federal government has released, and most states have seen for Lagos or Gun, or your state at least, um, have adapted um, from what the federal government has released as a guideline for school reopening. And there are some key th things, yeah, but the four key things in all of these things. Um, we have the, there's a conversation, there is something about infrastructure, about scheduling, and about um, behavior, and of course, some conditions for school reopening. And these themes are, similar across all states. Um, for infrastructures, the government has said schools should have um, a, a structure that allows them to space students properly, man, maintain two meters, create floor markings, um, create food, tra food traffic, create a structure for identifying and isolating um, people who possibly show symptoms. Um, of course, this, this might mean having a sick bay, having an isolation ward. Um, for scheduling, there was conversations around um, schools should alternate um, day schooling. Um, there should be staggered schooling hours, so maybe some students can come to school in the morning and others can come to school in the evening. Talk about shift schooling and then government was basically saying schools should create an alternative approach to ensuring that learning happens, irrespective of all of this. In fact, there was a whole lot of operational switch in this. So schools were expected to, you know, change timetable, scrap assembly has, you no know, do a couple of things. For behavior, um, we see that government has expected that schools create temperature check, enforce face mask, and then we know that these are students, some of them will be as young as um, early, early kindergarten classes, and then we have to enforce face mask and all of this. Again, there are some, government has released a whole list of protocols for school reopening, and some of them, um, include schools are not even supposed to appraise students for absenteeism. In fact, absenteeism is no more a crime. Um, we have to discontinue assembly grant. We have to appoint out officials. We have to um, develop a response team. And then each school will have to come up with, um, fill a checklist that, show, that ensures that they are ready to comply and able to comply with all of these things. And then approval will be on a case by case basis. Now, when we saw these things, um, the first conversation was, are schools really ready to do this? I spoke with a school owner yesterday, and then his response was, I think private schools will probably do this, but maybe government is having a double standard. Will government schools be able to execute on this? Um, or maybe this is, we should just step back from looking at how schools and schooling is being run today and, and ask ourselves what would be the most effective way to reopen schools and make sure everybody keep learning and make sure that um, we achieve the main purpose of students being in school. If government is saying we should alternate day scheduling, meaning that we have to um, blend learnings and some students are, uh, some students have to learn from home while some are in school, what will be the technical capabilities or the operational capabilities needed to execute on this? Um, so today we have the, the right persons to speak through this. Um, I'll hand over to Ayoko shortly and she'll be able to um, run us through um, some questions, some questions that we've raised, um, some questions that school owners have raised while looking at all of these things. And then 
we are going to look at what opportunity this brings and what learning school has been locked for some months. Some schools have done some form of learning, some are yet to adopt. What what are the things we learned from all of these things and where do we go from here? And God forbid, if schools have to be locked again, will we be better prepared? What will be the key things, the the hallmarks that says that we are ready for such things? And so, so these are the things we'll be looking at today. And of course, beyond that, we'll look at um, what are the alternative learning models, what is possible in a case where, um, what, what is possible if, 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 if this should happen again for whatever reasons and, and what's the best way to learn from this and not just forget this in history. Um, in the end, of course, we start with Mr. Yomi Ojo, who has just, com who has just com whose company, Schools Compass, has also done a survey, parent survey, on the impact of COVID-19 on schools and what parents are really saying. I will be hearing that in a while. And then we'll have conversations with our key panelists, who Mr. Ayoko will be introducing shortly. And then um, we'll wrap up with um, some free tools and free bills, um, some from Bailey and some from some of our pan panelists here today. Um, we hope that it's going to be completely interactive. The chat box, I see the chat box is bubbling already. Please keep your questions coming and um, be super active in the conversation. You can join this conversation on social media, um, but most important thing, we don't just want to have a conversation where people are excited. We want to leave this place with everyone having clarity on what it really takes to reopen schools and when it's safe to reopen schools and what we would do differently when schools reopen. So thank you very much for making it. Um, we look forward to a great conversation. Um, thanks, Ms. Ayokweji, and over to you. Okay, thank you so much, Shay, for making this very easy for me. You've laid a very solid foundation upon which I can build. Welcome, everybody, all our participants. Welcome and thank you for joining us this morning. Good morning to all our panelists. I will introduce you shortly. But four areas that I would like to stress before I introduce our panelists. The idea of reopening is focused on four areas, the learners, the teachers, the personnel, and families. Those are the four key groups. And government wants to ensure that there is safety. They want to ensure that there is um, learning going on. And most of all, government wants to ensure that if there's a need to reinstate the lockdown, education does not come to a standstill like it did before. And that's um, what um, she has said. So I'm really excited this morning as we talk about school reopening, alternative learning models. I'm really, really excited that we have such an interesting group of uh, panelists. And I'm introducing in no particular order, and I would also stress the areas they would be um, discussing or conversing with us based on. The first person is the national president National Association of Private Schools, NAPS. His name is Chief Yomi Otubela. Chief Yomi Otubela is an education activist and philanthropist with the notable footsteps in education landscape of Nigeria. He's a proprietor of Lagos schools in Orile Agege. In addition to this, he has a foundation, Yomi Otubela Foundation, and the objective is that from, of that foundation is to support the average Nigerian. They give out a lot of scholarships, and uh, that's part of what earned him the title Akeweje of Uwile Adege. Good morning, sir. Really good to have you on this panel. We also have in the house Mrs. Ronke Posh. Mrs. Ronke Adeni, popularly known as Ronke Posh. She is the founder of the Posh Schools. She's a Montessori trained directress and she also has um, another organization called Children's Entertainment Company. And so Ronke Posh, good to have you in the house. One thing I love about Ronke Posh is she is very blunt. She will say it as it is, professional in her ways, but that's, that's what Ronke is known for and she has this high level of energy that is infectious. So I'm glad we have her in the house today. She's going to keep the fire on trust from her to do that anywhere she goes. We also thank have... You. Good morning. Us. Good morning. Welcome and thank you for joining us. We also have with us Agatha. Agatha is the founder. 
sorry. Agatha is a founder and she's she's a founder of um so apologies, she's the co-founder of Why Blue Sky, an international organization publishing free online resources for teachers. She's also the founder of Children's University, which for the last 10 years has organized weekly live educational events for very curious K-12 students. They have over, as at 2016, they had over 30,000 graduates. Way back um, about eight years ago, that's 2012, Agatha delivered a, a, a TED talk and it was titled The New Normal. And so Agatha has um, looked at today, she saw today many, many years before now, and she will be focusing on outdoor play as it has to do with learning. Thank you for joining us all the way from Poland, Agatha. Good morning. Great. We also have Mr. Yomi Odubela, Sorry, Mr. Oluwa Yomi will join the house, who will share insights from a recently completed nationwide study on the effect of COVID-19 pandemic in Nigeria's educational system. Yomi is the founder of Nigeria's largest organic collection of school profiles of the school's compass.com.ng. He is an edtech enthusiast and a finalist at the Fidelity through PwC 2019 SME Connect. Last but not the least, we have Boye Oshinaga in the house as well. He will be providing tools to create a personalized learning experience for every student. Boye is the co-founder and CEO of Gradely, the host of this event, the host and organizers, and um, he, the, uh, the company was the 2019 winner of the best adaptive Learning Solution of the Year Award. If this was a physical gathering, we would all be clapping for them now. So can we just um, set the chat box ablaze with lovely comments and whatever you want to do to welcome our speakers. I can see it going, yes, thank you very much. Don't stop, don't stop. Thank you so much. So I would like to hand over to Mr. Yomi. Ojo, who's going to share with us his report. I didn't mention that his organization carried out a survey, nationwide survey on the effect of the COVID-19 pandemic on Nigeria's education system. I will leave him to talk about that, but for all school owners in the house, there's so many things you can take away. So dear panelists, I hope you have your pens, your your notebooks or your phones, whatever you want to use to take the information, please have it ready. Sit up, get your coffee. I have my coffee right next to me. It's going to be a very informative session. And the objective is for you to go away with something to do in your school. So I'll hand over to Yomi, only Yomi or Joe. Are you ready for us? Um, so checking, Mr. Yomiojo might be having some troubles with um, his network. We're checking him. Yomi, can you unmute yourself? We cannot hear you. So if you're in the house, please unmute yourself and you have the floor. Okay, whilst we're waiting for that, the areas that we're going to center this conversation on around, the first one is impact of school closures on the stakeholders. That's one thing um, we're going to look at. And to lead that aspect, we have, um, that's why we have Chief Utubela in the house. As schools, um, what's the impact on schools? Are schools really ready to go on? And if we have to have a, another lockdown, what is going to happen? Mrs. Adeni will focus on creative delivery and other alternative learning models. I'm really excited about this because before now, we had a lot of buzzwords in our industry. Uh, at one time, we had blended curriculum, then came blended learning, then came flipped, 
classroom or flipped learning. And I call them buzzwords because um, they began to sound like a cliche because people said these things, they threw these phrases around. We didn't quite see it. Thank God for COVID. COVID forced many schools to start to do all these things. So um, Mrs. Adeni would look at those and she would, she would say quite a bit about that because it's something she does day in, day out. Agatha will be speaking to us about learn, outdoor learning, idea safety, guidelines, and opportunities. And this is um, very important, particularly for early years. They've been very worried about how young children will come to school and not be able to play. So um, thank you, Agatha. You, that's what Agatha is going to focus on. And of course, Boye is going to tie it all up and um, share with us what we can do about personal, personalized learning experience for the children. Are we good to go with the report now? Um, unfortunately, no, we might have to come back to the report. Okay, um, not, not a problem. So I'm gonna go quickly now to Chief Otubella. Can I have him spotlighted? Thank you. So Chief Otubella, I'd like you to just share your thoughts. Where are schools at? We've had this very long break, thanks to COVID. We've had our guidelines issued. Lagos State or your state, Ogun State, practically all the states in the Southwest have come up. Before then, the the federal government came up with the guidelines and what the states did was to take the document and contextualize it and then release their own uh, documents. So what would you say, what's your thoughts on this? Where are schools are? Because you are representing schools in all the states of the Federation as well as Abuja. Yep, um, Ms. Ayopeju, just before Mr. Yomi Utubela, um takes up um, his conversation. He's, he's just gone offline. Um, he's, he's on traffic and he's trying to um, um, just, he will join us back in a moment. Um, I think it might be great to keep up with other part of the conversation. So I, I just get the two Mr. Yomis to join us back. Okay, no worries. Um, Mrs. Adeni, can we have, can you please share thoughts on this? Can you share thoughts on the guidelines whilst we're waiting for Chief Otubela to rejoin? You've seen sure. the document, have you? Have you? Yes, I've seen the big, thick 52-page document. <laughs> Good morning, everyone, and um, thank you for having me um, here, greatly. Um, yes, we had the document. We went through that very thick document, and we have already started implementing in one capacity or the other. Um, it is indeed a mammoth task. It is an expensive task as well. Um, even as we um, get ready for resumption, whether online or offline. So at um, Le Poche, for example, we have started, we have already mapped spots outside, outdoors, um, the social distancing. In the classroom, it's a bit funny because by the time you do two meters apart, you, you probably we have one or two children in the classroom. Obviously, I'm exaggerating. So where will the rest of the children be? Um, sinks by the gates. Whilst uh, many schools had sinks already, um, even since the time of Ebola, you have to have it by the gates now. Sanitizers at the gun um, for to measure the temperature of the children. The nurse, you need to um, hire a nurse in your school now. You need to have an isolation center in your school now. All these are going to cost money. A lot of schools already struggle with space. Space is a challenge. So when we have to um, re um, reduce the number of children in the classroom, some schools have um, 30 children in the classroom, and some schools have 200 children in the classroom, we're talking public schools now. How is that going to happen? So um, we, are going to be, we are going to have to be as creative as possible. The sick bay, for example, is another um, tricky one because a lot of people that I've spoken to assume that they could use the sick bay as the isolation center, but they cannot use the sick bay as the isolation center. When the child, for example, if you find a child that is ill, uh, maybe asymptomatic or has the COVID or whatever the case may be, somebody has to stay with the child in the isolation center. The child is not going to be left alone. So that is one resource down. And then 
Somebody has to look after any other child that is sick in the school, whether the child has the COVID or not. So these are some of the um, tricky things that um, I discovered on the, on the document. I know already that um, the number of schools are already um, struggling because they've lost a lot of teachers and a lot of teachers are not paid at this time. A lot of teachers are disgruntled at this time. So during resumption, when we resume physically, um, it's going to be quite an interesting um, experience um, for us. I think um, every, um, I think Agatha is back. I think Ms. Ayomi is back. I think so. Okay. Okay. Mm. Excellent. Um, Chief Otubela, if you're back, thank you for rejoining. Um, I know internet can be very difficult. I, we, we know that. So thanks for rejoining. And so we'll just um, go straight to you, sir. Have you seen the document? I know you have. And what's, where are schools at with this document? You have a question for you already, but at least please share your thoughts for starters. Okay, I'm not sure he's back. I'm not, I'm not sure he's back. So, okay, let me go to Agatha. Agatha. Okay, I just checked. I'm not sure he's back. Okay, Agatha, can you please share thoughts with us? You're still going to share your slides, but this is just a brief intro. What, yes. Um, what would outdoor play look like? I know you will share your slides, but in a nutshell, I mean, you are very familiar with Nigeria. You know that space is a challenge. What's the, what's the, what are your thoughts on this? Before we move to my topic uh, about uh, outdoor learning and teaching, I would like to refer what just was said uh, about uh, uh, the regime, the sanitary regime, uh, which COVID-19 prepared for us. So exactly, it's very difficult to, to deliver it, not only in Nigeria. I have, I'm in this good situation that I can compare because we are going to start our um, school year next week. So actually there is a very hot discussion going in media right now and we argue about it uh, and we, they are quarrels about it uh, because we are not sure that our schools are prepared. We have the same problem with the two meters distance, uh, distance in, the, uh, in the class, even if we have not more than 25 children in the classroom, it's still not possible. So we have to divide children into two groups. But what's, what's important, what you can take under consideration, that uh, you, don't, you, you don't have to complain. You have, even if it's difficult, you have to go with the school and with the teaching. So what you can do instead, remember that uh, you can use either mask or the distance. You don't need to use the both at the same time. If you have distance, you don't need the mask. If you have mask, the instance is so not much needed. Of course, it's better when you have the both, but who has this opportunity to have everything? Probably just some people, some schools. So if you have overcrowded schools, of course, to some limits, we can, you can give, deal it with it to some limits, you can think about it. Children have, have, have masks, and then you don't need to be so strict about the distance, okay? The another point we okay. just discovered that um, uh, Ronke just mentioned that uh, you, you, need, you need to have this special room for sick ch child and the, one of the teachers is supposed to go to stay with the child. But think about it from this perspective. If the ch teacher will stay with the child in the same room, we have to consider the teacher be infected. So what's going on to happen? The both of them are going to be locked down, to be quarantined for two weeks. So you have to look for the another solution, okay? This is another thing. I will talk about, uh, about uh, outdoor uh, teaching and learning because this is something what you can practice not only in the COVID-19 times, you can use it even if everything is fine in the right place. I found out it's kind of the opportunity to promote the different way of teaching in this COVID-19 situation because, you know, teachers are very busy people. People in education are extremely busy, but education is the very huge sector. It's, the, it's really huge. Every, in every country is the same. So it's very difficult to change it, to, to implement some improvements 
they go bit by bit, but it's very difficult to make some bigger changes, something which is uh, changing the life of children or, and, and teachers. And it may be strange, but COVID-19 is creating the opportunity for us because we are forced to do it. We don't have any other way to go with this. We just have to check another way of conducting our teaching. One of the ways is using the technology, and there are people who will talk about it. As it's, not, it's not my part, I just would like to mention it, that I'm aware of that. And I'm also aware that it's very difficult in Nigeria because not everybody has the computer. And uh, I mainly operate in low-income schools, so I can say that nobody has a computer. But we still talk about, about technology because we, have, we know that those children, those pupils have to adjust to the modern way, to the modern world. So they have to know how to use even the very low technology they have. And what they have, maybe not personally, but in the family, they have phones. So we can make the, the, the most possible use of the phones. I still know that not all, all phones are smart smartphones, just something like 20% of the uh, phones possessed by people from low income schools, society, they have smartphones, but still they have it. So the parents should think about it, that phone is the, the, the teaching <laughs> learning tool now. So they have to make it available <laughs> to children to use it. Thanks. So this is technology. On the other Thanks, side, we, we can use another spaces like our courtyards, for example. You can go, we, we can go to the field, we can go to the forest and have the lessons there. I will talk a bit later, a little more about this later. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much, Agatha. So I'm going to go back to um, Mrs. Adeni and let's just dive into your own area creative delivery, and other alternate, alternative learning models. Uh, a lot of schools have claimed to be doing um, online learning, e-learning, a number of them, different assessment, different methods. What's your assessment of the situation so far? Okay, um, thank you again. Um, my assessment, um, that's a very tricky question because um, I can only know the, what I know of the few schools that are online. And of the school, few schools that are online, whilst I don't have the exact data, I know definitely that it's less than 10% of the schools in Nigeria. A lot of schools are not online. Say for example, if not all the schools in the North are not online, because at some point I saw a, a formal document saying that any school that went online in the North would, will face sanctions, and they're going to be arrested and all sorts of things. So you can just imagine that population of children not being in school. So when it comes to assessments, the first thing I would say is that it is the minority of schools in Nigeria that are online. So if the minority are online, the first thing I will say is, or do is to clap for them for trying because showing up is always the first thing. So if you're here and you've tried to get online in whatever capacity, you are the real MVP. You're the most valuable play, um, player right now. And thank you for um, trying to move um, things forward. So that would be my first assessment, that people are doing their best, given um, an unprecedented situation, given that we are in a crisis and we are not crisis managers, given the fact that technology is something that everybody has to use. Now, school and uh, teachers generally, educators, um, it's a course, so education, for example, is a course that we give people rejects, in, um, quote and unquote, uh, people that are not doing very well. If you don't have a job, they'll tell you at home, why don't you go and teach until you find something else? Now, these people that are supposed to be the rejects in society are the ones that are supposed to be the tech gurus and are going to save the nation. So my first assessment is that we are doing a good job. Whatever it is that you're doing, it doesn't have to be phenomenal. The fact that you're showing up and you're moving the children along in one capacity or the other, you are doing a good job. And we are all trying our best. That we are here trying to learn, relearn, contribute, listen. Some of the things I'm going to say here, you already know them. Some of the things will be new. The fact that we are all trying to move the nation forward is 
just too important. And it's, it's, um, it's great that we have great people in Nigeria that still want to ensure that we are on global standards because what is happening to us is very, very important. It's a serious issue because the more we delay, the more that our children are left behind on a global scale. From Monday, schools in the UK are already going back. Schools around the world are going, returning to school. My nephew, my nieces, they're all going back to school. And I'm talking physical school. And this time around, you can't say you're not, there's no option. You are going back to school. We cannot continue to keep children at home or offline. We must choose to do something that is safe for our children to continue. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mrs. Adeni. Thank you. I'm not done with you yet. Um, we acknowledge all your questions and we will stay term. We will, we, will act, we will tackle your questions. Okay, Mrs. Adeni, still on that. So what would you recommend? I mean, you've been at this for a while. I know that your school has been doing it. Well, given the constraints, how do you think schools should go on? When we come, you did mention schools are resuming. So what would you advise schools? Well, um, generally, what would I advise schools to do? So if you have... So in terms then, so, of blending going forward. So in terms of blending going forward, so I'm not going to banter words here again because all those blended learning, distance learning, online learning, all those sort of things. The important thing is that we're learning. That is what is key right now, that we're learning. So what I would um, advise... Um, in terms of, um, is to number one, do our best. We have to do our best. And your best will have errors in it. It's not about perfection. It's about trying. It's about failing forward and learning from the mistakes that we make. So you are gonna make some mistakes along the way. You were going to have an LMS that you chose because everybody else was using that LMS and you find that it doesn't work for you. It's not about how sophisticated your system is because a lot of people are using video conferencing right now and they've forgotten that their parents cannot afford the video conferencing but they want their school to, be looking, to look like a tech school. So you might be using a video conference uh, facility right now or app and you, you are supposed to be using WhatsApp so that you can engage more parents. You have to look at your customers. You have to know your customers and then decide on the LMS that you're going to use. Whatever is popular is not what will work for your own particular tribe. So you must know your tribe as a school. Don't do what everybody else is doing. When you decide on the LMS that you want to do or the, or the platform that you want to use, you practice, practice, and practice. You practice internally. That's the first thing we did. So we at La Poche School, Prior to resumption, when the original, when school was closed down originally, my audio is, is low. Really? I, sorry, I saw a comment that my audio is low. Let me it's loud and clear at my end. Oh, it's loud and clear. Let me bring my mic up. Can you hear me now? <laughs> oh, wow. It's huge mic. You can't hear me. It? it must be your phone. I've got a huge, huge, huge mic here. I hope you can hear me. I brought it closer to me. Um, so, um, okay, people are saying it's clear. Love my mic. Thank you so much. <laughs> so let us practice. Um, let's choose the LMS. So what, what we did was we practiced in-house and made our mistakes. So some people hadn't used Zoom, for example. We did everything online, and then we piloted with our children. There was an orientation for parents so that we could know what works and what doesn't work. And that was how we personally discovered that, um, uh, video conferencing wasn't the best for our preschoolers because they would keep saying, hello, hello, how are you? You know, they were all over the place. So we had to do video lessons and do little less interactions. And besides, screen time is not too great for younger children, even for everybody, even for us as adults. So we were able to do an orientation, be able to practice, practice, practice. So that's one of the first things you do. So you know your customers, you know what they can afford, you practice the system, you plan, how are we going to do it? How many videos do we want to use? How many um, uh, video lessons do we want to create? How many times do you want to show up by video? How many, if you're using something like WhatsApp or a customized system like the Gregory system, for example, you have to plan when you're going to interact with the parents. You can't just throw messages any time of the day. Let them have a time when they're expecting it. We also did a survey with the parents 
so that we can know exactly when it is that um, and what, what it was that would be a challenge for them. A number of our parents at Lepo School are working, they're still working. So flexibility was very, very important. It's a time of grace above grades. So we were not saying that if we give you homework at this time at nine o'clock or give you classwork, it must be submitted by 11, if you, otherwise you're gonna penalize. This time is for continuity. It's a time where we must apply the love question and it's a time when we must be mindful. So it's not about um, huge deadlines or anything like that. So we were ensuring that as long as the children are doing their work, sometimes we had some submissions at 11 p.m. Because the parents were like, okay, the child has done the work, but I've not had time to upload. I've not had time to re return the work. I've not had time. So we allowed for flexibility because there's a saying in, um, in a practice that I do, which is um, NLP, and it says that the most flexible of the system controls the system. So you must be flexible in order that you carry every single person along. At Le Paul School, we did not leave any child behind. No child was left behind, no family was left behind. Only the babies didn't come to school, and for obvious reasons, three months old online doing what? Even, at, even those were sent a, a video. So you must also ensure that you get feedback from the parents and you communicate. The problem and the challenge that a lot of schools had at this time was that the communication was not great. Many schools send bills. Many schools send bills, and parents were like, how are you going to pay this bill? Communication. The 21st century skills that we all talk about, very important at this time, communication, creativity, critical thinking and collaboration, very, very key at this point. We needed to apply it. I had parents telling me that they were sending newsletters from Le Paul School to other schools because there was empathy involved. So the love quotient must be there over and beyond the fact that we are using tools or system. Right now, when you want to transition, people think it's the number of apps that you can use then how tech savvy you are. I'm a, I beg to differ. It's not how tech savvy you are. It is how empathetic you are, how loving you are as an organization. So I'm not going to talk about tools today. There are so many, just click on Google, you will see so many tools. But what made us, everybody at Le Poche, only two parents, and they had a challenge before COVID, every parent at Le Poche have paid. We, did not, we paid and we only did a 10% discount and everybody has paid. Teachers are on full salary to date, even now that we're having the summer holiday. I say that to say that it's empathy that will get people online. Our parents said to me that by the time she read the newsletter, she was like, if I have to beg, borrow or steal to pay these fees, I will have to do it because she could sense that there was love and compassion in it. This is what we need in a crisis to carry people along at this time. Not how well you are using the apps. You're using the apps so well, but you haven't done an orientation. The parents don't even know how to do it. It's frustrating for them, and they're calling themselves home um, school teachers. The parents are not school teachers. They're just people that are helping their children at home with the apps. That's what they're doing. They're not necessarily teaching the children. So let me um, leave it here for now, and uh, we'll continue <laughs> as time goes on. There's just so much to so. say. I said, I said, Ronke Porsche's fire would come out, and we can see. A few questions here for you. I think I'll just uh, do one or two. But before I go to questions, may I just um, say thank you and welcome to all our participants who have just joined. We have a number of um, panelists as indicated on the flyer. But may I also ask that you put your questions, separate your questions from the comments. If you want your question to get answered, please do not post it on the chat box. Put it on the Q&A box so that we can identify it very quickly. Two things I would like you to take together, um, Mrs. Adeni. First one is how can students go on and do their online learning if they don't have devices and internet facilities? The other, the, rela the related question which I'd like you to take along with that is um, being online is costly. Is it advisable for school, for online learning as based on regular, do, would you advise online learning based on regular fees? Uh, it's a bit clumsy, but I guess what the person is asking is, can he do online learning with the regular fees? Okay, so thank you. So let me start with the first one, which is number of students have no device and internet facility. How, how can they, will they attend classes, online classes? So I get, I get the gist. The gist is just, so a lot of people don't have devices, which is the challenge that the government have been telling us a lot of children do not have devices. When I started my research before the lockdown, I was speaking to my colleagues and friends and parents 
abroad. I spoke to people in Ghana, South Africa, America, and, the, and the, uh, Canada, UK as well. And one thing I realized is that we forget that in those countries too, there are people that cannot afford devices too. Because you're in England or you're in Canada does not mean that everybody there is affluent and they can, do, they can afford everything. No, that's not the case. So I got a particular newsletter from a, an institution in Canada. And what they did for children in deprived areas was that they were loaning them devices. Now, I know that loaning devices will not work in Nigeria, but they probably sell it and use it to eat because food is very important. So they were loaning devices and then they were allowing them to go to centers like say for example like a fast food restaurant and they will allow wi-fi to be there you go there at a particular time and you use it now that may not be workable here what can be workable here was something else that they also did for parents that just couldn't do it no device no wi-fi you still meet in school social distance with your mask and everything you get there they'll give the children lunch packs now i'm stressing the lunch packs because a hungry child cannot learn. It's important that our children are feeding and eating so that they can learn. So they will give them lunch packs and they will give them learning packs as well. They give them learning packs. They collect it at certain times. So group A will go and collect, maybe, let me, let me just give you an example, maybe 12 o'clock. Group B will go at one o'clock, so there are not too many at that time. So they were using learning packs. You collect it on a periodic basis. You go home and then you return it whenever it is that you stipulated that you're returning. It is possible also to use simple things like a telephone call. It is imp it's also possible to use town criers to go. So you go out and we say, okay, today maybe children in a community, 50 people are there. Um, today we'll be talking about plants. These are the parts of the plants and the teacher is on her megaphone or microphone or whatever it is. It is as innovative and as creative as we want to be. Innovation is not always technology. Innovation is just doing it in a way that is new, that is fresh, and can produce results. That is what we need. But we always assume that it has to be video conferencing, tech, this and that. Our situation is very dire. The government is trying, at least I know in Lagos State, to get the um, children to have devices now. We're started getting on board. I know they were doing the radios and, uh, and the television. However, it's going to take a long time to reach everybody in Nigeria. It can't even happen next year. It can't happen in two years. It's not a curse. It's just the way it is. So we must do what we can. What are those things that we can do? Is to try and social distance children in communities and begin to teach and learn. Because a lot of children don't have power. They don't have food. They don't have water. They don't have devices. If those devices are given to many of them, they will even sell it because the poverty is rife. So we must ensure that learning continues as manually as we can in deprived areas, just like we've seen and heard in other countries. Now, the second question Thank was, um, oh, the second question was, um, I forgot for us. Someone okay, it was me. about costs. It was about costs and yes. online Wonderful. learning. Excellent. Only yesterday I tried to get a course. I love, I love psychology. I do read a lot of psychology and I said, okay, let me just do a program in psychology. I went online and checked some schools. None of them gave me a COVID discount because they were even high profile schools. None of them gave me a deep discount. Say, COVID has come, take 20% off. Go to Harvard. They are not going to give you a COVID discount. Cambridge is not going to give you a COVID discount. You are going to pay because value is value. Value is value, but we do not see um, education in Nigeria, and I'm talking about that a lot on my Instagram right now, about education and things like that. It's the way we perceive education. If we value it, we will pay for it. If we value it, parents will not be setting up WhatsApp group and saying that it's our turn to make money now. You know, it's our turn. No, that schools have made a lot of money over the years. If you value education, you will pay for it, whatever it is. If you value education, even if you don't have the money right now, you will come to an arrangement with the school. Now, I'm not saying that schools should not be advertised and give a discount. We gave a 10% discount at La Poche. We did. However, value is value. I personally find online learning at this time more challenging than the physical class. And I'll tell you the reason why. 
we had a very short period of time to turn around the content to make it nice enough for online learning. It wasn't ready made. We were not using YouTube links. That was one thing that we were not going to use. We wanted our children to see us. So we customized our content. Content creation is a mammoth task at this time. It's not the same thing as you'll find on Google. You will not find Ronke singing on, on YouTube right now, saying, the color of the week is green, the color of the week is green, the color of the... No, you're not gonna find it's Thursday. You're not gonna find it. Customizing it, creating videos, Teachers sending me videos and I'm saying, it's not good enough. The distance between your head and this is not good enough. It's not bright enough. You need lighting. You need this. Your audio is not loud enough. It was a mammoth task. That is money. It costs money. It costs, people think it's just data, but it's intellectual property and it is priceless. So yes, you can charge the same. However, your customers may not, it depends on your customers again. Thankfully, my own tribe, that's why I say people should not just allow any parents into their school. Your own tribe won't give you a challenge. The posh parents, thankfully to the glory of God, they did not give us any challenge. They are our tribe and they paid. All right, thank you so much. Um, can you, in one or two minutes, take one final question? There are two questions that are related to how children uh, between ages zero and five can engage in online learning. There are two questions there. Can you just take those two? But before you take it, may I also say to participants, please do not post um, comments on the Q&A box. We won't take those comments. If you have a comment, a comment is one that doesn't need a response. You just want to share or air your own views. Fantastic. Put it on a chat box. If you have a question that needs a response, please put it on the Q&A. And I want to acknowledge questions directed at Chief Yomi Otubela. We're going to try and bring him on, even if it's just to uh, answer questions. He joined, but um, something went wrong with technology, and I understand that is being resolved. So, Mrs. Adeni, in one or two minutes, can you please take that uh, zero to five question so we can go on to Agatha, who's going to share her slides, and then we talk about the outdoor part, and we try and bring these things together. Whilst uh, Mrs. Uh, Posh is looking at all those, three things she said. Number one, love beyond academic. If you need to engage, you need to show empathy first and foremost. Then innovation is not about technology. Innovation is doing something in a new way, in an exciting way and a way that works. Functionality is key to innovation. Okay, Ron Posh, over to you. Okay, thank you. So I see, I approached an early year, zero to five. What is the best approach for my kids? So early years is also something that I love so passionately. And um, when this happened, I, I, there's something that we call situational leadership. Because a lot of people that were um, school leaders expected the teachers to go into the home and um, appear and do a job. But we forgot to be mindful and live in the present and know that this may seem like a simple task, but it's not simple for teachers. They've not done it before. Go online and be visible online. So, I wanted to let them know that I can do it. I'm not just saying you can do it. So I said, you know what? I'm going to teach this term. So during that COVID, as busy as it was, and I was sleeping at 2, 3 a.m., I was also showing up and teaching the children. So when you're doing early years, maybe you want to connect with me. I've got loads of videos. I've got like 200 videos. I love early years. So the best approach, number one, is to chunk. Chunk whatever it is that you're teaching your children. What you're going to do in the classroom is not, even in the classroom for early years, it's little chunks that you use, but chunk it even further. So you're having videos of two or three minutes. You're ensuring that your lessons are engaging. You're ensuring that you're using the child's name and you're ensuring that you're having a lot of fun. You're ensuring that you're using a lot of activities, not keeping the child online. Say, for example, we're talking about an island. Why don't you create an island? Then you show them how they'll do it in the, in the, on, the, on, a, on the video. The child goes home and creates their own island, puts water around it, records it, and returns it to you, maybe depending on whatever, maybe your grade list system, your child can um, return it um, in that way. You use a lot of singing, you use a lot of puppeting, you use a lot of action songs as well for your, uh, for your kids that are early years. Do you know what? It's, it's the most interesting. You know the, the big ones? You, you can crack a joke and they're like, 
What's missing? What's missing? What's missing? What's missing? What's missing? But the, you know, the little ones, they make you value what you're doing. The minute you show up a lot, they are just, they just make you feel like a celebrity, you know? So I love the LES. They are actually the easiest, but people say that they are finding it hard to engage them. But I think it's the strategy that you're using. Chunk, don't stay online for a long period of time. Let them look for, in fact, when we are going offline, they're like, no, I don't want to go yet. So what we do is we now leave them online for about five minutes supervised so that they can interact with their friends. We do sports online as well. So we do things that are action packed. We don't sit down like we are here now with preschoolers and talking and lecturing them. <laughs> it's not gonna work. They're gonna get bored, they want their mommy, they want this and that. But when you come and it's action from start to finish, you will engage them and before they get bored, you are out. So for preschoolers, that Thank really, really works. Thank you. No problem. All right. Thank you so much. Welcome to everyone who has just joined this webinar. School reopening alternative learning models. And that was Mrs. Wonke Adeni, founder of the Posh Schools. We also have Agatha in the house. She's founder of Children's University and um, co-founder of Why Blue Sky. I'm going to move on to Agatha shortly, but I'll just take a few comments from the comment box. Thank you to those who joined us from Bayelsa. And I also see here that um, Afed is sharing devices. So please go through the chat box. There are many, many interesting comments. And please send, to your, send a message to your friends who are not able to join on Zoom. This webinar is live on Facebook. I'm sure we are all excited about this. So share that information with people and let them watch it live Facebook. And the beauty of having it on Facebook is they can always go back and listen and listen. Mrs. Adeni has shared a lot of tips what you can do to the zero to five. So you can go back and listen and take those things and implement in your school. This is not about feeling good. This is about adding value to you your school, and of course, the children in your school. So I'm gonna go over to Agatha now. Agatha, can you share your screen? Share your initial thoughts, and then we will start the other conversation. If I may, um, before I will go to outdoor teaching, I would like to refer to what Rankesh um, said. Actually, I love everything what you said. I would like to sign up for this and uh, just just few more thoughts because this is the conversation right so let me let me share them what i think uh, that um, what is difficult in online teaching and learning it's not only technology it's not that if you have access to the beautiful computer with the access to internet you are done you are the master and you are the winner it's just the beginning uh, I actually, I would say that this is the, the, the minor problem, not the bigger problem, the technology. The bigger problem is how to use technology. If you know how to use it, as Ronka said, you have a lot of songs, you have a lot of activities, you just search internet and you, you have the um, activities for 24 hours per day because internet is full of this. But you have to know how to search for this. You have to know what to choose, who is, uh, what was proper for each, ch uh, with each child, how to talk with children about it. Is it just that we just give the children the link and they will do it by themselves? So it's not only about the access, it's about what to do. It's about the processing the information and taking the decision. But it's not all. Even if we are very fluent with this, they are still another two uh, other problems. The first one are engagement of parents. Actually, I would say that it can be the problem, lack of in engagement. Of course, if parents are engaged, it's good for everybody, but some parents are not engaged in ed education and they, they say, it's not my job. Uh, I'm not a teacher. I don't know what to do. I don't want to be engaged. I just want my ch ch child to be sent out from the school and to go for the celebration day just to see how, how good he or she is. But COVID-19 creates the opportunity. So I'm talking more, mainly about opportunity today, not about the problems, because we can engage them more in the education 
because we, we can be in constant touch with them. It's something not that you just see them from time to time picking up children at the gate. You can talk with them online. You can ask them how the children are doing. Do you observe any problems? What is your problem? Of course, it takes a time, but it pay off because you can make uh, the alliance with your parents and it will pay off later that uh, they will understand much better what the education is about. This is sometimes happened to me. I will talk about outdoor, but I will also talk about activity-based learning. Uh, this is what we promote um, as uh, the Wild Blue Sky and we did it in a way, Children's University as well. Sometimes it's very difficult to persuade parents that this is the right way to teach. Uh, the school owner or the head teacher is uh, convinced teachers would like to do this, but parents say it's not really learning. I want them just to be sent home with a lot of homework and to just write for something, some essays for two hours. This is the real re learning. They don't appreciate it. So we have to work with them. We, ha we have to take this opportunity. And the last one, and I think this is the most important. And the, the question is, can our children learn by themselves? Because if they are at school, this is the teacher who is a guide, who say, now we are doing this, then we are doing that. Sometimes in some schools, children repeat after teachers what they just said. Uh, everything is organized by teacher, children are not taken in the organizational work. So now we expect that they will be able to learn by themselves at home. This is very important uh, skill. Actually, I, it's not on my agenda today, but because there is the opportunity, I will mention it. Self-learning, people have to know how to learn. If they don't know how to learn, um, they will not learn because they just will wait for the instruction. And uh, the, the modern teaching is directed toward self-learning. There is a lot of self-learning now. Teacher is just a facilitator. Teacher is, is just making the educational situations, but it's not pushing the information inside of children's heads. So this is the very important question. Are they ready? And maybe we, we, because we don't have choice, we have to help them to be ready for self-learning now. And the last thing, I don't know if my slides are ready now. Uh, let me check. Yes, I can, I can share. So let me do it like this. Okay, whilst you're doing that, thank you so much, Agatha. The last point Agatha made I think is something that school owners must focus and reflect on. Can children, can they self-direct their own learning? The reason we had the major setback during COVID is because teachers were cut off. Communication with teachers was cut off for a while. So learning hung. If a child knows what to do, if children can go curiosity, find information on their own, know what to do with it, then learning will continue with or without the teacher. And I think that's something really important that we all need to look at as educated, educators. Otherwise, the next time we have a lockdown, then we will have the same problem. And remember, COVID is here to stay. COVID is going to be with us for a long time, the same way we have the flu. So if, we, if that is our situation, then we must begin to teach our learners how to learn on their own. Thank you very much. Over to you, Agatha. Thank you. Okay, so uh, we, we, we were talking mainly about um, distance um, uh, education. So uh, actually I will smooth go to, all, uh, to, to, uh, to outdoor, but let me just add one more thing. This is what we did uh, be, uh, um, during the lockdown time, because White Blue Sky is cooperating with many schools. I think they, they, there is more than 400 schools who cooperate with us right now. Mainly they are low income schools, the schools without computers in the school and in homes, at homes as well. So what we did, we produced this kind of uh, uh, work, uh, worksheets for, uh, for, um, uh, for students, 
and we distribute it to, to, to children by parents. So what are uh, on those worksheets? They are uh, information, about, they are instruction about simple activities, about, about uh, uh, some, um, some, um, uh, some activi scientific ex uh, um, activities, for example, like on this picture. So we, uh, they were aligned with uh, curriculum, so it's not, it wasn't done by random. So we, we know Nigerian curriculum and we are mainly focused on, on the science. So this one was about science. We just keep busy children with science and we let them to do some experiments at home. So you can see uh, one of the pictures, the photos sent by the parent and uh, this very young lady is probably future scientist because she's the, she, she did a lot of um, different um, experiments and sent us the pictures. So this is the way how we can not only keep children busy, but to do something what they didn't do at school before. So uh, we made the, the, the learning at school exciting because you, can you imagine the situation of the children at, the, at home? Probably you can because mostly you have your children and you were also, you are also the parents. So you know those situation from your perspective. Uh, many, a lot of children felt very alone at school because they were far away from, uh, from uh, their friends from the school uh, and they liked playing a lot with, with, with the friends and they did, couldn't do this. Uh, so they, were, uh, they are a little bit afraid of the situation. It's not that they don't understand what's going on around. They do. Uh, so uh, if you overload them with the regular learning lag, do those worksheets, from page this to page that, and just send to me. It's, it's not uh, the best way. Because they will do this if they will uh, get some marks after that, they will be forced to this, but without any joy. And if they will, over, if they will come to some problems, they will don't know how to overcome them. So maybe better to do something which will be more engaging for them, which will help them to learn themselves because this is the way to get it to, 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 to this point. If you do experiments, the instruction is very clear and we did it in this way that children could follow it. So, uh, parents are just uh, helpers in this. It's, it was not parent job, it was child job to do this. And then they ask questions and parents, do, parents just help them to find the answer. So it's not that they will give them the, the proper answer. They will search for the, the answer together. So this is the way how children care both. They can be engaged in learning and be prepared for coming back to school. They are engaged by, uh, by discovering some new things. And they also, uh, they, they are also promoted to be curious about, uh, about this, this situation. So they ask questions and asking questions is the best way to learn. So it was about what we did uh, previously. Of course, we, we just get some pictures because mostly those children were not able to do those experiments because of the lack of the um, internet, because the parents were not um, willing to help children or children didn't know how to learn themselves. So, uh, so fortunately we are about to going back to school, to the, to the place which we know the best and where we know how to organize it, what to do there, uh, how to proceed. But how the, this learning is going to look like in the school? Here are some pictures. Uh, they are real life situations from different countries which already started learning. It doesn't feel um, the best possible solution from my perspective. I think that those children are very lonely again, even if they are among the students, about, among their the friends. Look at this one in China. It's very flashy classroom full of yellow boxes. Each child has a, a his or her box, but they couldn't see each other even. Uh, I saw more, many more pictures like this. They even during the lunch break used those boxes. So they even during the lunch break couldn't talk to other children. I think they, they are very unhappy. Uh, so can we avoid it? Can you, do you think that the learning will be efficient when children are unhappy in the school? 
I think they, are, they will be not. Is there any other solution for this? Of course, there are different solutions. Here you can see two pictures from, da uh, from, uh, from uh, Danish. Uh, there are some countries like uh, Finland, um, Denmark, uh, sorry, Denmark, and um, so uh, something like that, which already opened schools and they had three months of experiences running schools under COVID-19 situation. So what they do? They decided to promote our, uh, outdoor learning. Uh, I don't know how they will do it in the November and December, for example, and January, because there is a winter in those countries, the same like in Poland, so it will be much more difficult to do this because the weather is not predictable. But still, if it's not raining and uh, if it's not fr freezing, we can go outside, we can put our coats on, there's not this problem in Nigeria at all. Uh, so the, 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 the weather is very predictable uh, there. So you can take children outside and they are much safer. On those, the first picture you can see the class of, I think, eight or seven years old children. And there is a regular lesson. There is not uh, any kind of uh, special activity. They just have taken everything from inside and put it outside. The, the, the blackboard, uh, worksheets, tables, everything is outside. And this is how they learn. Because of this, they don't need to, wait, uh, to, to, to use masks. They feel much, a little bit more free because of this. On the, the next one, you can see the lesson with, uh, with teenagers on the uh, summer on the ground. You can see that they have coats because there is something like 18, maybe 15 cent degrees there, so they need to have some coats, and they do some activities there. And they do it not on, by, on the occasions, they do it every day, and at least 50% of time they spend in this, this way. This is what we promote as well, Blue Sky as well. So actually it's not only because COVID, this is the way how we teach teachers to teach as well. We teach them to use activities and most of the, those activities are taking place outside. Um, you probably wonder if you can do a regular uh, curriculum using this way of teaching. So I prepared for you several slides showing uh, the photos from the lesson taken out outside, taken uh, place outside, and all of them are uh, related to Nigerian curriculum. So the first one is actually the, uh, the, the lesson I liked most. Uh, we, we conducted the, the, these lessons with students and also with teachers because we teach teachers how to use this kind of activity many, many times. I think I did it by myself something like 50 times uh, in 50 different schools. And those children are playing the game of viruses. The lesson is about uh, how it happened that I get cold. It was about going, getting cold, of course, this time, because we did it before COVID-19. We didn't have any idea that by this lesson, we prepared children for COVID-19. So what we did, First, we, we uh, organize the situation in which children pretend to, uh, to pass the infection from one child to another. I use the glitter for this. So by shaking, shaking hands, uh, I pass the glitter from one child to the another. Then I, I just ask them who is infected and it occurred that everybody was infected. So it was the way how to, to show them how the infect, uh, infection is traveling from one person to the another. I didn't need any um, board to just write uh, some notes about it, just to talk a lot, because instantly they understood it, this, this, this concept. Then we, we, we teach, we, we talk with children how, uh, if there are any other way to transmit the infection. They talk about coughing, for example, or, uh, or sneezing. I ask them, how do they sneeze, pretend it? And everybody, what they did? They did something like this. So where the, the viruses are now? Are, they are on your hands. Oh, so maybe it was wrong. Maybe there is another way to, to sneeze or cough. So we teach them how to, do, to use the elbow. But they understood it. It was not academic stuff that I don't know why uh, they asked me to do this strange way of sneezing like this. It's strange. 
Now they understood it, that they can avoid the, the, the direct transmission to, to hands. And then we play with, with uh, teachers first, then with, with students, the game. What's in, what happened inside in the children, in your body when you are ill? So we, they pretend you can see some smiling children and they are very happy because they have viruses and they were supposed to attack the body. And then the, uh, the antibody came to fight with them. So by using very, very simple objects, like for example, bells, it was for antibody to make a, little, a lot of noise just to make the body aware that something bad has happened. Or by using the gloves, for example, something very, very easy to find objects and even tissue paper, it was for viruses, something like this, we created the role play outside of the school. And it was full of fun, full of understanding, because everybody understood. I talked with children, if they understood the process. They did very well. They could talk about it, what happened. And it was very safe. So you can okay. do this kind of activity in the, in the COVID situation. So it was from the health study. Uh, if, if we take language, for example, we use something like this, very simple game. We, Thank we, you, Agatha. We have just, sorry, you have just okay. about a minute, minute and a half to wrap up because we still have a, a number of questions to tackle. Sure. Thank you. So if you just would like to wrap up and the main points you want them to take away, then we'll move on to the questions. All right, so, so let me share it for, one, for a while to just to show you the last slide for this. Yeah, um, so each of those lessons uh, are connected to, uh, to curriculum, but they are much more because during all each of those lessons, we can develop students' uh, skills like critical thinking, collaboration, creativity, and communication. All of them, those skills go together and compose problem solving. And problem solving is the main a skill which is desired by, by managers right now. So employers uh, want employee who have the problem solving skill. And uh, now we are in the real life situation because COVID-19 created for us global classroom. Uh, and we have some project like uh, uh, problems related to this new situation to be solved. So why not to use this opportunity and to teach children to be problem solver because they see this. It's very, very real. It's not academic. It's not the buzzword, right? It's very real. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you so much, uh, Agatha. Thank you to all participants for the great comments. Thank you. I'm going to call on Yomi Ojo very quickly. Yomi Ojo is the founder of School Compass. And um, he's, he carried out a survey nationwide. And this, he's, uh, the findings of the survey is something that is very useful to schools. And school owners, I advise that you listen carefully uh, to what Yomi Ojo is about to say. A number of participants have asked for Mrs. Adeni. That's Ronke Posh's number she, uh, or contact. She's put it on the chat box. So just go through the chat box and you will find it. Yomi Ojo, you have the floor, please. Can you share the findings of your report very quickly in three minutes or four minutes, Max, so that we can go on and take the questions. Thank you very much. All right. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry I, I came late. I have, for some weird reasons, I have um, a technical issue with my, uh, with my internet connectivity. I'm so sorry about that. But nevertheless, I think it's um, better late than never. Yeah, a couple of weeks ago, uh, my organization, Schools Compass, carried out a survey to see the impact of this um, COVID-19 and how schools were able to innovatively uh, improvise by providing online platforms and online um, um, structure for, uh, for to engage these, um, these students. So we understand that a lot of Conversion has been going on back and forth between school, between the stakeholders, I mean the, the school owners and the, um, the the federal governments and all that. So we decided to 
uh, take a, a further step by taking out the pulse of the parents or how they, what they feel and how this is actually impacting. The result, unfortunately, I will not be able to, to share it, but I promise to share it because it is not yet officially uh, out. But I'm going to uh, share some insights. Uh, as, uh, of course, the data is, is still intact uh, about, about it. So it turned out to be like a 40 about 40% of schools, for one reason or the other, were not able to provide um, any form of engagement to, this, uh, to their students, one way or the other. So, uh, but what happened is that some of these uh, schools, uh, some of these some of the affected parents have to seek out joining other schools or uh, um, going into like top party platform like um, Gridly to to get their children engaged. Uh, in terms of um, fee, about um, seventy percent of these of these schools uh, are, are, are did uh, free online uh, online um, uh, schooling for their kids and about. Um, about 1.1 percent had their tuition fee collected as 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 it was before COVID-19, and about uh, 41 percent uh, of schools have their uh, the fee for the online services highly subsidized. Now we now ask the parents how engaged. No, what are the form of engagement we have through uh, for these children? Um, about 22 percent of them said they were completely offline. One of, some of the reasons is that they could not um, leave their children alone online because they have to go to work. So we have about 22.7% uh, of parents who, uh, who um, homeschooled their, their kids during the uh, virtual tour term. And uh, but, but more than 45% of schools were able to provide online service to, 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 to their to their, uh, students. Unfortunately, 10%, 10.6% of these kids were not able to engage in any form of uh, academic activities, whether online or offline. 10.6% of them were not able to do that, unfortunately. Now, we now ask them that, okay, those who are engaged online, how really engaged were you? Because I, I, I listened to Ronke Portu, she, I'm, of course, you know, she knows I'm one of her favorite fans. Uh, when he was talking about how, and I, I got her, I, when they were talking about how this, how to engage as far as these preschoolers. And we now ask, how engaged do you think your kids are? And um, about 70% didn't feel, uh, didn't feel it at all. They didn't feel engaged of, of all the children, didn't feel engaged. Oh, let me, uh, let me quickly say we are able to get 283,000 respondents through our database, through online CPE, and through some um, other digital platform. So we have a huge number and uh, across Nigeria, but about, um, okay, about uh, in all this, about 56.2% of the respondents are from the Southwest. And um, North Central, we have about 16.45%. North East, we have about 2.3%. And um, South South, we have about 16.73% of the respondents from these geopolitical zones. So majority of these results are actually from the uh, uh, Southwest, according to this, um, the, 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 the report, the, the result of the survey. So 10% uh, parents were not able to engage for one reason or the other, but 22% of them actually engage offline, either by, uh, a, um, by hiring a private tutor or by teaching their children at home themselves. And about 8.9% um, of these parents were able to engage third party platforms like Gradly. Uh, so I keep mentioning Gradly because I, can't, I cannot be advertising other, other brand on their platform. So like Gradly, 8.9% uh, so of parents actually use them instead of uh, using their uh, schools. We have a couple of uh, about 1.1% of parents who use both of them by using, they use uh, third party and they also are engaging in, uh, in their school uh, stuff. We also ask, ask these, these children, uh, these uh, parents, how close do they think this, this thing is to the physical classrooms? As in how, how are they, how, 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 do they feel as, as if they are actually in their physical classrooms? And uh, about 39% uh, 39, about, um, 39 says yes, it is manageable. 70% uh, yes, it's close to that. 
and 11.6% agree that it is very, very extremely close to that. So we attribute this to this, the kind of uh, technology they use. But 32.5% say it's not close to it at all. Of course, we, uh, we also attribute to the kind of technologies these people use because uh, for my findings, uh, technology can actually uh, fill in some of this, uh, this, this vacuum. So we also, okay, uh, range Mr. of- Mr. Um, yes, please. Sorry, can you please just a uh, quick question? Go ahead. The information you've just shared, yes. what's the actionable point for owners? What can they do? What information can they take away and act on? Okay, uh, okay. Let me just go straight to the last slide. Lara will answer that. About 80% of parents are happy to resume school as soon as the schools are, are, are advised by the uh, government guidelines. 80% of parents are happy. Just 1% says, school, no, until the vaccine is out, I'm not bringing my child to the school. So my takeaway is that schools should adhere to uh, the government guidelines. And um, schools that are, if government permits, I would recommend, this is from my personal thoughts at, at, at the moment, I would recommend that schools, it, we will, as time goes on, we will have a student that, that will be attending two schools, one offline, one online. For instance, if I live in Kaduna and I like Le Paul School, I can enroll online as a student, while some will be offline. So online could start from um, four to six. When I finish my day school, I can opt, to, opt, at, opt in for um, um, online schools. So what I can see, I see a lot of opportunities for school owners to latch into. If I cannot, be, if I cannot afford your school fees of, uh, online, I should be able to do something online. I still get the same value as if I am I am in your school. So basically, that's that's the conclusion of this um this survey. But in the next um uh, five days, it should be officially out, and I promise to send it uh to as many um as as many uh, viewers as possible on this platform. Thank you Any so questions? much. Thank you so much. We will take questions. Thank you so so much, Mr. Ojo, for that. So school owners. It is 6%, that's approximately 6.7% of parents are happy to bring their children back to school. Um, opportunity also is if you have a very strong online school, people can log in from, there's a big school in Lagos that I know, and I know that they have subscribers from the US, from the UK, joining their online school. So it's, it's open. And I know also that there's a school in Joss and they have subscribers in Lagos. So if you have a good, if you have good quality product, people will key into your product from all over the nation. Agatha, there's a question here for you. And it says, how can, uh, the person says, how do you teach literacy and communication outdoor? Can you attend to that in one uh, minute before, Agatha goes on. I know there are questions for Mr. Chief Otubela. Unfortunately, he's not going to come back and join, but the arrangement to, to answer those questions. So don't go away, just hang on. Someone is asking, what's the demography of the, um, the sample for, the, for Mr. Ojo's um, report? Mr. Ojo, can you answer that very quickly? Sorry, I didn't What's get that, sorry. What's the demography? What uh, demography okay. did your survey I, cover? I said so uh, earlier. Um, um, I'm going to minutes. The demography is 56.3% um, is from Southwest. Okay. 16.73 is from South South. Okay. 2.6 2 Southeast. Okay. And 5.58 Northwest. And 2.32 um, Northeast. And we have 16.45, not central. Thank you very much. Um, Njidiaka, Kevin, I hope um, you got that answer. And I know you also have asked questions directed at Chief Otupela. Please do not go away. We will attend to your questions. Okay. Agatha, can you please take the question on literacy? Agatha, one and a half minutes, please, or one minute for that question, please, yeah. so that we can, we still have one more major thing to do so we can do it. Yes. So, so my one minute answer is very, uh, can be even quicker. Uh, we are going to start uh, 
uh, training, one term training on this, on literacy and language, which will start on October 1st. Uh, 1st. Because uh, now I just can give you the tool. And for example, now my slides are off, but maybe you will see something like this. You, can you see the boy going on the little um, pictures? This is the game which will show, which help very much with literacy. Uh, for example, children can go by some clue. For example, find pictures, find the, the, the objects with letter, letter B or connect the letters which uh, are uh, diphthongs or something like this. You can, you can change this game in the man, very many ways. So this is just one example what you can do to make it outdoor, to make it um, excited for children, but I have just one minute to answer. So you can join our training. Okay, all right, thank you very much. Uh, I know that questions have been asked to, about uh, getting the contact of our panelists, especially Mrs. Wonke Posh and Agatha as well. So Agatha, can you type in your contact on the chat box? Wonke Posh has typed hers in, so please go back there and check. Mm -hmm. So over to, before we now go to the final thing, for me to hand over to uh, Boye, there are two questions here, and I'm going to um, pick Ronke's brain on both questions. I'll give a perspective to it as well. We were hoping uh, Chief Otubela would um, attend to these questions. Unfortunately, uh, so, um, technology and one other thing came up, so uh, we will stand in for him on this. And the first question is, are parents ready to embrace, this was actually a comment about um, um, for our parents, they're not willing to engage. But there's another question here which says, what is the government doing to alleviate the burden on schools who have <coughs> not had any income for over six months and are expected to prepare for school reopening these are these areas to wash hands, face, mask, to wash all the, the three W's, wash your hands, wear your mask, watch your distance. I will respond based on a number of things. Um, I, I've been, I've moderated a number of webinars. I have um, also been a panelist on several. I work with different schools, both public and private. And what I would say is a school is a business. A business must be responsive to its tribe, as um, Ronke Posh said, let me borrow her word. So if parents, if the need shifts, then if you do not move, it's like cheese, who moved my cheese? Is the cheese still in the wrong place or have they moved on? That's one thing you need to consider. What government is going to do, this debate has gone on and on for so long. There's not much government can do because those schools are private entities. That's the reality of our nation. The schools are private entities. I know in other climes, Government has um, done a lot, they've intervened. Unfortunately, in Nigeria, government is struggling to get its own schools running. So if we're waiting for government to give us, we can sit down and blame them from now to kingdom comes. I know a number of people will not agree with this. They expect government to do things. What government is likely to tell you is, maybe you want to come to their school where children do not, um, do not pay fees. That's what they will say to parents. Now for us as school owners, I believe, as um, Ronke said, number one is engage your parents. You need to engage them. And I know two school owners at the beginning of this, um, both of them low-income schools. And one of the school owners, when this COVID started, her parents sold her point blank. We do not have money to get data. So if you like, do online school, we're not going to join. And what she did was to arrange with her teachers, and they used to deliver packs to those children at home. She bought them the mask, bought them gloves, bought them everything. They took a risk. But today her school is standing and she has moved partially online. The other school owner who insisted that she wanted to set up an online school went ahead and did that and only about 10% of her school population joined her. She's struggling today. So if you're not responsive, and this is my attitude to it, the school is a business. Define your market and service your market to the best of your abilities. Service your market in such a way that they come looking for you and then they recommend you to others. 
But to sit down and wait for government, I would say a private school is a private business. Yes, we know it's service. We're supporting government in doing this, but we are not doing it free of charge. So if you want to have a business, offer value, and money will chase your value. So that's what I would say. I don't know what Ronke's thoughts on this are. So we'll take that, Boye, please get ready. We'll hand over. Ronke, what are your thoughts on government um, response to private schools? Um, well, I don't think that um, people should, should be private schools anyway to be waiting for the government. I don't think we're going to get a lot of aid or if any at all. I'm not convinced. Um, I still spoke to one of my saying it was really confirming how much trouble that a lot of schools are in right now. Um, the interest rate is in double digits. I don't think that the government will be our salvation. Uh, it's not gonna happen because even Loma and many government um, public um, officials have not been paid. So I don't see how they will leave that sector to come and aid private schools. It's not going to happen. And it's the sad, well, it's the sad reality because there are schools and businesses in some other countries that get grants at this time. So if you're waiting for the government to do something, um, I'm not saying I know the answer, but it's very, very likely that nothing is going to happen. We'll just be waiting in vain. So in that time, we can be looking for alternative income sources to support the school. I have sent a video to Sheyi of Gravely. I um, had some videos. For, I've also done so many webinars when I was counting. I'm shooting 100 now that I've done in this lockdown. And uh, I did a video um, of alternative income sources for schools that, um, that people can do, not necessarily with any capital. So if you're doing things like graphic work or videos, or you're working as a virtual assistant for organizations, um, so that is also on my YouTube channel. You can tap into it and look at it. But I'm not convinced that the government is going to do anything at this time. We must carry our staff along because we will still need them. We will not, so even if you're not paying them, I mean, please try and reach out. Whatever you have, when you have it, please try and reach them because they're the most critical at this time. Um, during the COVID, my teachers, I put them on my head like a crown um, because I just knew that um, moving forward, you really need them. So it's a difficult situation, um, but the government is definitely not going to be the answer. Thank you so much. Um, uh, Njideaka, Kevin has said, uh, does that mean uh, government doesn't value education? Remember, this is not put together by government. These are personal opinions. We are not able to stand for government and Chief Otufela was not going to come and stand for government. He was coming to stand to talk about the reopening. He is a leader of a private school as well. He's not in government. So uh, as private school owners, I love how I got, no, it was Ronke who defined um, innovation. Do something new. It doesn't have to be technology. Just do something new. Do it in a functional way. Do it in a creative way and a fun way. So ladies and gentlemen, um, we've come to, to the tail end really. And so I would like to say thank you. Boye is going to wrap this up properly, but this has been a very informative uh, conversation. Please get the guidelines, the key areas that guideline um, is focused on. Number one, preparing your facility, making sure you have the required points, hand washing points, you need to check the temperature. Government says um, an isolation room. Uh, we understand how these things work. Yes, you have an isolation room, you have a nurse, but you want to endanger your entire school population by keeping a child with COVID. Even when we didn't have uh, COVID, the rule for most schools was if your child is ill, take your child home. The school is not a hospital. And I'm sure Ronke should agree with me on that. Ronke, do you have the habit or did you have the habit of keeping sick children in school then? Of keeping did children in school? Sick, sick children in school. Sick children. No. Good. No. So it's still the Even same principle. In the mornings, we check them up. Even for scratches and things, especially yeah. those little ones, we don't let them into school at all. That's it. So yes, it's good to have an isolation room, but the plan really should be do not take sick children in because by doing that, you're endangering everybody in the school and you do not want that. Prepare your people, the teachers must know their protocols and learning is important. 
So it's important because government is now saying we all, as schools, we must all have a plan to have a blended um, approach to learning. Blended simply means all the alternative models, we bring them together. What will children learn in school? If there is a lockdown and they have to be at home, what will they be learning? Mm -hmm. The flipped one is that you know children are going to attend school three times a day. The remaining two days, what preparation are they making for the three days they will spend in school? So it's important to balance all these things. So ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us. It's been an hour, 45 minutes of interesting and informative discourse. I would like to hand over now to Boye Oshinaga, who's been, who's going to wrap this up. My name is Ayokwe Junji Deaka. I'm the MD of Natural House, and this has been great. It's been a great um, conversation. Thank you for this opportunity, organizer. So Boye, over to you. Thank you very much, um, Sidiaka. Um, it was been, it's been very enlightening for me. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Ronke. Um, Adeni and Agatha William. Um, what I, I've learned a lot of things actually. Um, I think specifically things like the outdoor learning and the ideas, the, the sheer amount of ideas that is possible with outdoor learning. I think that's something that really, really struck today. And I think, you know, just like uh, Ms. Ronke said, one, everyone who has tried to react or to kind of be proactively do something about the situation that we are in you know, deserves, you know, some praise, that you've done something, you do not just leave your students and leave your parents and leave your teachers and, you know, say it was because of COVID. Uh, and I know that some schools really fell by the wayside. So well done to you for uh, getting to this point and still striving to make education better, right? Um, but I'm very, very happy about how this has gone. And I just want to cap this up by talking about an aspect of learning. So like Mr. Ipeji was saying, there are a lot of um, terms out there. You have blended learning, which means you're combining physical and online. You have the flipped classroom, which is another form of blended learning. You have all these kind of terms. And I'm sorry to introduce another term to you, but I think I'll just try to break it down so it's not something that's just a term in your head, which is the idea of personalized learning, right? Why should learning be personalized? Like what's the What's the value of this new term that I'm describing? Uh, I want to start with the fact that, I don't know if you know this statistic, but the United Nations Development Report from 2018 did surveys around Africa and found out that, and not only in Africa, all over the world, uh, but especially in Africa, the situation is worse in Africa, um, and found out that students who have completed six years of schooling, and this is excluding kindergarten and nursery school, right at the end of their primary schooling do not have enough literacy to read a sentence basically they cannot read they cannot do what they should have been doing in primary two or primary three um and and so if you, if you give them a sentence like the name of the dog is poppy or something like they will not be able to read it or calculate anything and they had finished primary school in fact they're supposed to be ready for secondary school and in fact the statistic is very stark because statistics says they are just about 225 million learners in school age learners in Africa, and close to 200 million of them, which is nine out of every 10 of them, are in school but not learning. That is basically like our report card in a sense, because that's telling us that, you know, including our schools in Lagos and our schools in Bayelsa and our schools everywhere in Nigeria, that we are having people in school but learning is not taking place. And so why is learning not taking place? And what does, what does learning really mean? Like, why, what is affecting that outcome? Like, was that gap and you know that kind of brings me to the second point which is that there's something called the bloom two sigma effect if you if you've not heard about it before uh, a scientist uh benjamin bloom um found out that you know when you do um experiment with a control group on one hand and then a, an experimental group on the other hand and in the control group you do teaching the way we are doing it which is that you teach to the whole class you have 50 people in a class, like our school are trying to optimize how many people are in the class and things like that so that you can have enough money to run the school, right? But when you do it like that, compared to when you do one-on-one -on -one tutoring, like this one person to one child, that the difference is at least two standard deviations. 
And so what that actually means is that 90% of people who are going are having one-on-one -on -one, um, sessions with tutors using mastery techniques are at least the top 20% of the normal class. That is, they are the people who are brilliant. So you bring a child and you taught him one-on-one, -on -one, he will most likely come to your class and excel there. And so what that means is that the most optimal kind of class is the one that almost kind of replicates the one-on-one, -on -one, right? And so that kind of very, very different from how we do traditionally. I would like to just share my slide um, briefly, just something to kind of just show you what I'm saying. So, sorry guys, I think I'm showing. Yeah, so basically, the difference between traditional classrooms and, and what, what adaptive learning is. So I'm going to talk about personalized learning, which is the same thing as adaptive learning. And basically, the difference is that in, let me show you on the different slide. In traditional classroom, right, the reason why you're having poorer results is that you are saying the same thing to everybody. You are, you are basically teaching the same thing to everyone. And in a personalized class or personalized learning class or adaptive learning class, you're adapting it to the individuals. In traditional learning, you are going content first. In adaptive learning, you're only showing content when necessary, right? In traditional learning, you're ignoring that the student knows some things already. In adaptive learning, you are taking in consideration that the child knows something and that is not a, an empty slate, that is not tabula rasa, right? And then the last piece is that in traditional learning, you always start from the beginning every time. You say, I want to teach you about, and you start from the beginning. But in, in adaptive learning, you're following up on where the student has trouble in, right? And so what is personalized learning? And this is basically the definition of personalized learning or adaptive learning, like I said, you can switch those terms. Um, it's, it's an online delivery method. It does not have to be online, I was telling some teachers, but it's enabled best with online, enabled best with technology because technology is a, has a way of augmenting the teacher. So it allows the, the, the teacher and the school to automatically adjust to each learner based on where they are. It recreates the one-on-one -on -one thing that we just talked about that, that creates the bloom to sigma effect. Mm -hmm. And then lastly, uses analytics um, and so on to, to um, adjust real time to create an optimal experience. So now that I've said all of that, I just want to kind of encourage us as, as a group of uh, proprietors and school owners that you have not started making a difference in the child's um, learning until you're impacting his learning outcomes or her learning outcomes. So it is fine to try multiple methods, but it's important to identify that you are making you know, some progress with their learning outcomes. That is, before they did not know how to calculate um, complex numbers, now they can, and you're able to track that in a very data-centric way, right? That essentially is what Gradely as a company, as a product, is helping proprietors do every day. So I would, at the end of this um, session and around enough, I will we'll share a video just to show you what Gradely is, and you can contact our salespeople and everybody, uh, anybody in the team. But I just wanted to encourage us to ensure that we are thinking about individual learning outcomes, understanding that children are not on the same level. So the fact that you are doing the same thing for all 200 children in your school does not mean that you know, they are all progressing at the same rate. Those who are falling behind, you need a way to track and find out why they are falling behind and exactly where they are falling behind and then do things about it. So thank you very much. That's just an encouragement and also a vote of thanks to everyone as a round. And I will share in a video. Shea, you thank you very much as you share the video. Thanks. Bye-bye. <laughs>
Hello everyone. Um, so I just thank you very much for the for, for gracing this great event. There's your last poll. Please just um, answer the poll, and we will share the results with everyone. We'll also be sharing the materials for. Um, we'll also be sharing the materials for this event. So slides from Mr. Yomi Ujo, um, some of the videos of Mrs. Ronke Porsche, and we'll also be sharing materials around. Um, I got Mr. Gata Williams. Um, material as well so please just expect that in your email but please fill the poll um, answer the polls and thank you very much thanks to all our panelists we are almost grateful um, happy to to continue to have a relationship with you because of how valuable you are in the ecosystem thanks mm -hmm. to everyone who joined the call